Welcome back to this special episode of our series India at 75. I'm speaking to someone who has trod like a colossus on the financial sector uh, for a better part of the past 75. I've been speaking with Mr. Deepak Parikh. Mr. Parikh, thank you very much for your patience and for staying on. Let me come to what we did right after 91. Do you think the issue of bank licensing was a very good start to uh, pulling up the financial sector? And do you think we have done enough to, uh, you know, remove the uh, public sector inefficiencies? See, the financial sector, it has always been an evolutionary process. Okay. The requirements under different banking structures have evolved over the years. Guidelines have undergone many, many changes at different points in time. Yet, the RBI has been right in adopting an extremely cautious approach on the fit and proper criteria. Mm. And there have been lessons learned on this through the years. Though there is on tap bank license regime for mm. universal banks now, I think RBI is right in having a stringent selection process. Okay. You know, they're not permitting industrial houses to yes. start banks. Now that's part of the Reserve Bank's uh, thinking at the present moment of time. Uh, let me also mention that credit must go to the RBI in its efforts of identifying stronger partners for some of the old private sector banks. Absolutely. I don't want to name them. Rata, you are aware of three or four of them, yes. which were on the brink of collapse. And Reserve Bank got a strong partner and uh, or an existing bank to revive it to turn these banks around and and uh, you know they've played the role of an investment banker in a in, in a central banking uh, yes. role to salvage these banks and save the wrath of public depositors and the confidence the people have in our banking system Definitely. Definitely. so um, one hopes that the strate strategic disinvestment of idbi huh. which has been touted for a long time yeah. and it's a long time long-standing issue we'll see the light of day sooner than later let me come to uh, the equity markets in general i mean uh, again that's something that has uh, uh, been your strength your group strength you all have been an anchor for uh, the equity indexes how does india's equity market evolution compare uh, to other countries is this an outstanding success story See, there is global acknowledgement of India's well-developed equity market. <clears throat> and by market cap, we rank amongst the top 10 globally. The test of a strong equity market is the ease with which investors can buy and sell and how liquid markets are. Yeah. And we have proved both through the international and our Indian investors that are, it's easy to enter it's easier to exit mm. and liquidity is there when you exit. Yes. So, yes, one can say that the foreign portfolio investors have presently been net sellers for most of this year. But the good news is for the last month or so, I have yeah. seen net inflows coming back into India. Yes. And I was on a recent trip to the US and I just got back this weekend and it reassured my thinking that U.S., which has large investable resources, will find its way to India. And there are very few places those large sums of money can go to because we have the growth opportunities. Many fund managers I've spoken to have said that the emerging market funds had also exposures in Russia and China. Okay. So redemption pressures has forced them to sell out from the most liquid market, which was ours, and where their investment has been most profitable. And that happened to be India. Okay. So really, it was an unintended consequence. That's how markets work. Okay. Both China and Russia, for different reasons, have fallen out of favor with foreign investors for the moment. Yes. So when the overall market sentiment changes, at, a, at will at some stage, I think it is changes as we speak, Already, changing yeah. as we speak, 
perhaps there is little more certainty on taming of inflation, many fund managers have affirmed mm. that foreign investors already have India on the top of their list of emerging okay. markets. Our markets are very well regulated, so there is no concerns on that front. Well, that's good to hear. Actually, I was just reading some data when I was preparing for your interview. Uh, apparently, India has uh, over 200 companies uh, of over $1 billion uh, uh, sales, which have given 5x growth in the past uh, 25 years. So, I mean, I think that's the highest concentration of high performers uh, anywhere in the world. This comes from a stock investor. Okay, so let me come to the one market which everyone complains did not develop and your thoughts on the debt market. See, there has been a lot of improvement and deepening of the debt markets over the last couple of years. But for a large economy like India and for an economy that needs very, very long-term funds for infrastructure, I think we still have a long, long way to go to further develop our debt markets. Mm, okay. It's a work in progress. For instance, Indian government bonds mm. are not represented in any global bond indices. Now, they're the most liquid, as you know, in India. Yes. This could be, if Indian government bonds are represented in any global bond indices, it would be a big game changer for us. I have read reports that suggest if this were to happen, India could get anywhere between 150 to 200 billion debt inflows over the next decade. Mm. Because of the credibility of the government and the ease of entry and exit. Mm. Another critical issue is that we do not have an active securitization market. Yeah. Now, if our credit markets need to deepen, we will need an active securitization market. There are a number of small NBFCs who can double up and triple up their businesses, but they don't have adequate liquidity and mm. there is no securitization where they can sell their existing assets. Yeah. But as you know, the regulations um, are becoming more onerous actually for small NBFCs and NBFCs per se. Yeah. So I feel secure. it's time that securitization should start in India at this stage when the Reserve Bank is looking at uh, containing some of the large NBFCs and the middle-level NBFCs. Mm -hmm. So, okay. therefore, it is important for smaller NBFCs to be able to be originators of loans mm. and not keep the loans on their books. Fair enough. Because that would need more and more capital on a more constant basis. So, securitization today, deals still largely happen bilaterally. And there is virtually no secondary trading in these papers. Mm. Our debt market will be developed when that happens. Mm. We do need deeper markets. We need takeout financing. We need long-term structural debt and more sustainable green and social bonds. Mm. But we have a long way to go for this. This is work in progress. Mm. Let me just come to, you know, the inflection point we are in terms of fintechs. You already touched on the issue of UPI and, uh, you know, the payment system. Uh, do you think that can absolutely extrapolate uh, financial inclusion as well as uh, the ability to give credit to more people because of, say, things like account aggregators? See, you see, you're seeing a number, number of digitization initiatives from across the board, small, large, medium, micro, including account aggregators that will be enabling tools to help make better and faster credit decisions. There's a massive amount of innovation taking place, which needs to be encouraged. Yet, I think the regulators were right in increasing scrutiny mm. and reining in fintech firms that were lending without being under the ambit of requisite regulations. Mm. because they were growing dime a dozen. You cannot have millions of payment organization of fintech firms that yeah. are, uh, uh, you know, without any regulation. 
So I support the curtailment of the buy now, pay later services or curbing non-financial entities from extending credit lines. Okay. Because without check and balances, it can pose a severe systemic risk in the years to come. But for certain, we see an exponential rise in financial inclusion. Today, rural India is driving more than half of the internet usage in the country. This was very much revealing to me when I read this. 50% of the 692 million internet users are from rural pockets. An estimated 346 million Indians are engaged in online transactions. 346 million Indians, be it e-commerce, digital transaction, which is more than the entire population of the US. So there is great hope in furthering financial inclusion, in, in furthering the e-commerce transactions through this method. But they have to be properly regulated. Okay, fair point. I've never uh, uh, seen you so uh, optimistic, uh, uh, Mr. Parikh. You began on that note. But leave us with some caution. Uh, what can go wrong that uh, can, uh, you know, drag us back from this goal? See, first of all, what concerns me is whether we as a country will be able to create sufficient jobs oh. that can meaningfully create a better life, that can create a better future for our vast youth. How do we make our demographic dividend work? It can only work if there are more jobs. And given how critical job creation is, it is important that we have more robust data on our labor markets, on employment data, has to become a high-frequency, reliable indicator of the health of our country, or the health of our economy. As is the case in many Western countries, you see unemployment numbers come out every month. So we need to continue to strive to improve the the second is i would say one is employment mm. second is continue to improve ease of doing business across sectors yeah not make it easier for foreigners or indians both of them for both yeah. indian and foreign businesses because that will be the key deciding factor in getting large scale long term overseas investments there is still fear of slow decisions, time-consuming, too many approvals needed on a regular basis. Equally important is having a stable, clear tax regime. Ambiguous tax laws are irksome for investors. Laws have to be created or crafted, I would say, such that they are either black or white. Yeah. The problem we are having is too much gray which gives rise to arbitrary interpretation and uncertainties for corporates. So that's the third point we have to look at. And lastly, I would say the pending, pending judicial cases is a tipping point. There are 4.7 crore cases pending at yes. various courts. Our courts need to be unclogged. So India certainly needs more effective mechanisms to handle construction and infrastructure arbitration. Yes. And better and faster commercial dispute resolutions. I think this is where we need to work in the next few years to get that part of our action right. Okay. Okay. If we fix these issues, India will truly be a force to reckon with before 25 more years and much sooner. Well, that's a great set of blueprint uh, uh, points that you have put before the country. And all this is coming from a man who has traversed the previous 30 years with uh, undisputable success. Uh, Mr. Padek, thank you very much for joining us in this very special edition of India it, at 75. It's 44 years in HDFC. Okay. All right. Half a century. And uh, ah. we look forward to your guidance for the next 25. Thank you very much, Mr. Padek. <laughs> thank you.